the medicine of things. Hello, I'm Ryan Grek, one of the co-founders of Digital Health Malta, and I would like to welcome you to this panel entitled The Medicine of Things, which will delve into the intersection between Internet of Things as well as medicine. Joining me today are Dr. Dia Falson, an associate at Fennec and Fennec Advocates, who practices mainly in tech, media, and telecom. He regularly consults in the fields of intellectual property, IT, as well as privacy issues. I would also like to welcome Mr. Kenneth Terribela, who is a senior technical sales engineer at Melita, with years of experience in telecoms, data centers, and IoT solution. So, um, over the past couple of years, I think IoT usage in the different industries has been growing, and in some instances has been quite integral in changing the way that we live, play, and work. And this has recently made its way bit by bit into the healthcare industry, and I want to kickstart this discussion with you, Kenneth. Now, what is IoT? What is Internet of Things? First of all, Ryan, thank you uh, for the invitation to join um, this panel this evening. Um, let's kick off the subject. So, Internet of Things is basically how we can communicate with our devices, whereby each device can send information um, to a central system, and then that information can be used for its benefit. Um, in this case, we are here discussing how we can use um, IoT, um, for medical solutions, being, for example, you can track a specific machine, such as an X-ray machine within a hospital, to monitoring of a patient, to a third-party wearable solution, so the scope is extremely vast and can begin from one small sensor to a big machine. Okay, so say you have someone who is diabetic and they need to obviously maintain you know quite strict blood sugar control because if it goes too low then he or she will experience um, weakness may also lose consciousness or you know if you have someone who um, is also diabetic they want to maintain um, adequate control of their, their their glucose because it can cause long-term damage to the body tissues how can an iot solution help in in, in this case look it's a very, very good example which you mentioned. Um, uh, a good case in IoT, which is currently being looked into heavily, is glucose monitoring for patients who are diabetic. And what makes an IoT solution different than any other form of solution um, is the following. So let's say we have a wearable device which can monitor the glucose within a patient. Okay? Now, an IoT device is wearable, so it is a non-invasive form of monitoring. Let's say the patient's glucose suddenly goes low or suddenly goes up. If it goes within a parameter that the patient, for example, can fix by himself, then this IoT device can send a signal to the patient, either via smartphone or some other means of solutions. If it is a wearable, it can vibrate. Um, and the patient knows that, listen, there is something, something is wrong. So they can either um, increase or decrease or do the test uh, to confirm the reading. If, for example, on the other hand, there is a, trust, a drastic decrease or a drastic increase which the patient himself cannot control, then it can send alert either to a third party, a guardian or, or a hospital or a clinic, someone that can send his specific location and telemetry so they can now listen, this patient who, which is in, who is in this location needs medical assistance ASAP. And the next question which comes along is, but why IoT? Um, IoT can give us solutions which pr give us prolonged battery life. So we can have a sensor with, for example, three months battery life, six months battery life, because it is not something which uses data constantly, but the scope is that when necessary, the device sends data. And here I'm not speaking about sending a large file or a large image. We just want the data to be there when necessary. This is only sending a small file. Listen, the reading is up, the reading yeah. is low. Ah, that's very good. Okay, so I, I think um, from what you're saying, it can be applied to a, a wide variety of different chronic diseases. And it certainly looks like it may actually be part of the solution to kind of decrease the costs of health care, um, possibly reduce errors, and I think um, ultimately make everything a bit more efficient. So um, ultimately, what we are dealing with is personal data, really. And I think it can be considered one of the most valuable forms of data out there. Um, I wonder whether and, and this is open kind of to, to both you, um, whether you can offer some insight into the movement of data from kind of the device to the cloud storage for analysis. And, you know, it 
practically offers the opportunity, I guess, for hackers to be more creative, um, so as to speak. So my question really is, you know, what about security of IoT yes. um, devices? Mm -hmm. I think if I may, Kenneth, yes, I good. think before speaking about like the data aspects and the personal data aspects, let's take a step back and look at IoT like from a general perspective. When you have an IoT device, at its core it is communicating, because otherwise without the communication aspect, the IoT device can be a bit useless in this particular application, which we're speaking about the medical field here. So when you're speaking about a device which is constantly or rather on demand broadcasting broadcasting something, then you'd need to then you'd need to look at the whole regulatory sp um, aspect of it and the regulatory landscape for uh, radio uh, communicating devices is already out there. So that's one aspect of the IoT device, which is the regulatory framework which governs uh, all the devices which uh, operate electronically and which are broadcasting signals so that's one aspect of the of the of the framework and then obviously when we're speaking when we're adding this extra feature in it so this is not just an IoT consumer device now it can be a professional IoT device which is handling <laughs> medical personal data now if it's handling personal data which means data which uh, relates to a specific identifiable individual and especially if that data uh, is medical or is uh, the actual term is like it's health data, you know, so it's health data concerning a particular individual. Then, of, of course, the regulatory framework in that, in that field, which in the EU, as, as you'd know, is the GDPR, then that provides additional safeguards um, to, to, regulate, to regulate the health data. So, uh, you know, it's, we're not just speaking about your average fridge freezer or your oven, we're speaking about like certain specific things which are highly regulated. So the risk assessment there would need to be uh, uh, on a much more uh, on a better scale, you know, even from a security standpoint. So as you said, and in fact, there are various initiatives because this is something that we need to mention, you know, it, um, regulation of IoT, even in the EU, is still as it's as at its infancy. So there isn't like there, there are like a variety of laws which are trying to be applied to the IoT landscape, but there are more laws which are being enacted and even the EU Commission and there are even ENISA, which is uh, an the European Agency for Cybersecurity. They're all looking into the space, you know, so expect things to develop further. Um, one point which we can also mention here is that if let's say we have a security attack on a system where suddenly all the devices start saying, listen, this patient needs assistance, this patient needs assistance, this patient needs assistance, it can cause a total mayhem to the healthcare system. Because like, if we say, listen, if a person needs assistance, we need to send an ambulance, and suddenly everyone needs an ambulance, then who really needs an ambulance and who doesn't? So we are here, it's not a matter of, like what they are said, it's not a matter of having a refrigerator or an oven, but we are speaking about health. So it's of utmost importance that security mechanisms which are being developed can do not just encrypt the data, but encrypt the system itself that it cannot like suddenly send triggers which are false triggers. Exactly. And that obviously boils down to listen, it's a matter of security versus health and here we are speaking that if a system falls down, it can break the healthcare system technically. Mm -hmm. And I think Ryan, if I may as well, this ties in with some, uh, yes, some sure. incidents that we've seen in the consumer IoT field where a lot of IoT devices on, in the consumer um, uh, landscape have, uh, have been subject to DDoS attacks, which basically is distributed denial of service. I'm, I'm sure Kenneth can expand further on this, but basically because these devices were not designed with high level security frameworks in place, then they were subject to hackers simply turning them into like their own bots and overloading a particular system. And obviously you cannot have that with in within the medical sphere. And that is why, as I said, the regulatory landscape is, is fast on their tail because even with consumer Important. devices, they want to include some security, some basic level security, let alone with these medical devices, which obviously now we're not speaking just about a data breach, you know, this is about the safety of a particular patient. So you, you have okay. different frameworks acting together, you know, you have the safety, product safety, you have the uh, individual safety, and also, of course, the, the breach in, in data. That's great. So um, I think uh, if, if I may, um, I want to move on to something maybe which is a bit more topical. Um, so something relating a bit to COVID-19 um, at this point. So I want to talk a bit about contact tracing. So a good number of countries are now making use of some form of contact tracing gap. And um, 
now we are sort of starting to get some information about the actual usefulness of these apps. I think I, I, I was reading um, an article a couple of days ago, which kind of said that, for example, in France, where you have a population of around 67 million, um, only around 68 people informed the app that they were infected. And only 14 users were actually alerted that they might be at risk because of um, close contact with, with someone who was infected. In the meantime, running in parallel, um, I think we are seeing some companies that are implementing IoT solutions, which make use of physical hardware rather than pinging f from your phone. Maybe can it? Uh, um, maybe you can elaborate a bit on how these things actually work, and in, in your opinion, what advantages they might confer over your standard contact tracing app. Look, the benefit of IoT is that it is a, de a developing technology. So. It is being used, um, especially in the current times, to how can IoT be used to like um, uh, track a patient or say, listen, in this case, contact tracing. So this company, what they did was um, that, let's say I have a form of a badge. I can wear this badge when I go into work. I can put it on my work lanyard. I can put it on my shirt. I can pin it in. But as soon as I went to work only, I put it in. Okay. Now, the most basic form of contact or rather social distancing that this app can provide is that if, for example, I come into close contact with Deo, this badge can flash, so it shows a light. So physically, we know that myself and Deo are in close contact to each other. So we know that, listen, something is wrong. So either I step back or he steps back. This case, for example, can be used in school children, because it's simple to tell the children, listen, if there is a bulb, a red bulb, then you know, you know that you are too close to proximity to someone else, so step back or, or like someone is wrong. That is one form of basic sensor technology. But how can IoT make this development useful for contact tracing? Okay? Now, let's say I'm wearing a badge, all my colleagues in the same office are wearing this badge, and we can sense that I have been in contact with my person sitting opposite me, for example, for two minutes. I can be in contact with my manager, for example, for one hour. I can be in contact with someone else only for 10 seconds. So each beacon has its own information. Okay, its sensor has its own information. Now they can send it to a centralized form of system. And this centralized system then can send it to the cloud or other localized storage. And if someone tests positive, in this case to COVID-19, for example, they can know that, listen, myself, Kenneth, I was in contact with Deo for two seconds, for example, that day, but I was in contact with someone else for a whole hour. So if I'm positive, it's a likely scenario that the other person needs to go, for example, to get a swap test. But in the case of Dale, if I was in minimal contact with him, it might not be the case. So they can use that form of technology for contact tracing um, uh, at a workplace. And the benefit of this, when you compare to the app, is that when I leave the office, I literally remove the badge, and that's it. It is no longer tracking my, my, my information. It doesn't have to use my smartphone. There is no risk of, listen, if I'm giving it access to my smartphone, what form of privacy do I have at home? What form of privacy do I have outside of the office? And then if I go back in the office, I put it back on and it starts, it starts tracking again. A benefit of this is that IoT, the device that is using IoT to send the information, can be used in areas where the typical mobile device does not have, for example, LTE signal because IoT can use different forms of technology that can penetrate the ground further so they can be used underground. They can be used in areas which aren't easily accessible. Okay? And like this, uh, we're making use of contact tracing using an innovative way without using technically the smartphone app so people might actually want to use it more than having that risk of privacy being invaded. So I think this is quite a quite an interesting way of dealing with contact tracing. I, I mean, um, it certainly looks quite advantageous. One of the things which maybe comes to mind is that most people nowadays have a smartphone, whereas this would require, um, you know, selling this um, beacon to, to every single individual. And uh, with this, maybe I, I, I will turn the conversation to you, Deon. Um, 
it seems like maybe, like Kenneth was saying, it might be more accepted within mm-hmm. the general population in terms of privacy. But how do you um, mm-hmm. do see it in terms of privacy issues when you compare it to the app? Mm-hmm. No, I think the issue. I think the issue with this kind of solution isn't technological, of course, because ten- technology can do whatever you want. You know, uh, you s- you talk, you spoke about like the the um, um, whether people were using the smartphone app or whether it wasn't successful. We don't have uh, perhaps that kind of information locally, but of course the problem with that is that it was voluntary, and I think we mentioned in some previous Digital Health Malta event that the, the issue with the, with the smartphone app is that it's voluntary, so obviously you know you, you won't get the, mm-hmm. the use case uh, benefit out of it. Now, if we're speaking about a device which uh, which the em- employer, so to speak, because uh, Kenneth mentioned the use within, the, within an industry, within a, an employee-employer perspective, you know, whether the employer, employer imposes it upon you, and obviously then it stops being voluntary, so we cannot really compare it to the smartphone app. Um, uh, published by the um, launched by the health authorities, which is entirely voluntary, and I think the issue is with the specific IoT device. Uh, what data it send? What data would it be sending? Because if we're speaking about just that small IoT device, which simply pings or simply lights up if you're in close proximity, then perhaps that's purely anonymous data and it doesn't even fall within the realm of GDPR. Because if it's completely anonymous, the data then it doesn't even um, uh, fall within it. But if we're speaking about then data within a, a bracelet, which is perhaps generates a heat map, for instance, because as Kenneth said, like it would know whether I am in too close proximity, then we'd need to look at how it is generating that heat map. If it's generating that heat map because it's tracking us through the GPS signal, then perhaps people, w- uh, you know, the, ri- the risk assessment there may be a bit too Excellent. intrusive on the, on the people involved because really and truly you'd need to ensure, for instance, that it's only tracking you within the Within the within the boundaries of your workplace, and even if if it does that, that yeah. there are still some locations within the workplace where you wouldn't want to be like completely monitored. Like for instance, if you're using <laughs> like certain private facili- personal facilities, yes. the bathroom. So this is yes. th- these are these are risk assessments, and these are uh, you know w- legitimate interest assessments we call them that need need to be need to be carried out before implementing such a solution because. Even though the data passed can be minimal, but we need to check the specific use case scenario there because you can make it as complex as it, it, it can be, you know. And it's important mm-hmm. that, especially in an employer-employee relationship, sure. the employer is seen as having the, uh, the most power, you know, because uh, he can impose certain things. So that is where this would the, be an issue. Exactly. Maybe <coughs> one final thing because I think our time is soon running out. Um, quick. Quickly in 30 seconds, there maybe um, any insight in what's yet to come in the future landscape of regulation within the EU? No, as I said previously, I, the EU and the EU Commission, and there are even um, anti, antitrust measures and competition studies which are being made in the IoT in the I, uh, IoT sphere. Because as you know, IoT can be quite centralized, and you have a number of companies which are consolidating a lot of data, and definitely that is something to that is something to follow because the EU Commission has just launched an investigation which covers both the e- um, covers EU, US and Asian companies to see exactly what this kind of... Thanks. So uh, um, I think certainly from, from this conversation, I think that the future looks bright for IoT and I think it has quite a big role to possibly play in medicine as well. Um, and from this brief discussion, I can see how provided the correct security framework, we can possibly advance research and well, ultimately continue making people safe and healthy because that's our... Um, our ultimate role in, in healthcare. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. It's been great having you on, and I want to thank you both for being here. Thank, thank you for your invitation. Thank you.